Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa. My name is Timothy Walker. I'm a researcher in the Peace Operations and Peace Building Division of the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria. Today I'll be talking about opening sea, Africa's seas for trade. Now this is a topic involving maritime security, maritime development, the ocean's economy, and Africa's place in maritime trade and transport. In order to do this, I will be referring to a paper which has recently been published by the ISS. I will include a link at the end of the presentation, but I will also uh, talk, refer to the paper, and it can be picked up at our offices here in Pretoria. The structure of my presentation will firstly involve around discussing the concept of the blue economy. Now this is something which is often discussed, but is not always understood. There are many different ways of understanding what a blue or a maritime or an ocean economy uh, means for African states, but as well as Afri the African Union and uh, in the globe. The best way of conceptualizing what a blue economy is, is to think of Africa as a big island. This is a term that was coined by Erastus Mwenche, the deputy AU, the deputy chairperson of the African Union Commission. Now, if you look at Africa as a big island, you see it as 38 coastal countries with 26,000 kilometers of coastline. 90% uh, of Africa's imports and exports are carried, 90% uh, of Africa's imports and exports are maritime. So they are carried by mostly foreign flagged vessels. Now, this is something which uh, is sought to be changed because only 1.2% of uh, African trade is carried by African ships. If you look at Africa in this way, the dominant kind of concept which is used is the African maritime domain. Now, this means the geographical area around Africa and also the various sectors and industries involved. So we're talking about fishing, we're talking about tourism, talking about natural resource extraction and various other things, including uh, trade and transport, the transport of goods. Now, within Africa, there are various regional economic communities uh, and nation states with various different laws on how to conduct maritime trade. So introducing an element of alignment and integration is seen as key to producing a blue economy because there are potentially billions of US dollars worth of wealth to be, right, de to be derived from the maritime domain. Now this can be, as I said, through fishing, tourism, oil extraction, etc. But in order to do that requires a lot of investment. So to create the necessary conditions is something which the African Union has set forward in terms of creating an African renaissance through various documents. It has a maritime strategy called the 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy. It also sets forth ocean and blue economy development in its agenda 2063. This is also discussed at the international level. For instance, the United Nations has made its 14th sustainable development goal, the sustainable use of the world's oceans. And uh, the WWF, the worldwide, um, um, the worldwide um, World Wildlife Fund, excuse me, it recently estimated the uh, value of the ocean's economy to be around 24 trillion in value. Now, this is something Africa is not benefiting from to the extent it would like, but also there are tr huge losses occurring at the same time. Africans are not able to uh, participate in this ocean economy or to create the necessary conditions to derive maritime wealth from uh, resources within their own waters. The idea of the blue economy, therefore, is to help facilitate the growth of African economies and derive wealth, not just from maritime resources, but also to enable trading conditions and trading networks for inland countries, as well as resources which can be carried by African ships to other countries in the world. This brings me on to the point of what is maritime security? Because while we may have maritime development, what is good, the, the basic question to be asked is who will be secured? In security studies, we often talk of the referent. So we talk about who is going to benefit from being secure. What do we want to secure? Um, in this case, we are often confronted with the inability of African countries to protect their own seafarers and ships from uh, maritime crime, for instance, piracy. Uh, the growth of piracy has been the most visible and most obvious form of maritime insecurity. This has resulted in losses of, of estimates, uh, estimated losses of billions of dollars to a, a, a global shipping network. And also, for instance, a, a increase in insurance costs 
for a shipping company might be uh, eventually passed on to the consumer within inland countries because the price of transporting goods has risen so much. So we usually end up talking of piracy as protecting vessels. And as I've uh, just said, most vessels transiting or passing by Africa are not African flagged, they are foreign vessels. So often when we talk about countering piracy, we are in fact talking about how to protect foreign flagged vessels from harm. Um, what we need to be talking about rather is a human security orientation for thinking about maritime security. So this involves that with the growth of a blue economy, there will be more African seafarers, more African interests and more African goods and uh, vessels at sea. Securing those in the case of maritime crime will be very important. But to do that requires partnerships because Africa often lacks the capacity within, uh, within countries of, for instance, naval power or coast guards to prevent or deter attacks. But also it lacks the capacity often to follow up, to create, ju um, to create justice and also to, uh, to punish those who have committed maritime crimes. So we're talking about a very broad understanding of maritime security within African waters, covering not just uh, foreign vessels from uh, pirate attacks, but also the creation of conditions for African prosperity and livelihood. So that means securing against crimes which might be happening against fishermen. So there we talk about illegal fishing um, carried out by foreign vessels entering African waters, which there is very little capacity to often to prevent. Um, while we talk about shipping and foreign vessels and the lack of African vessels, it needs to be asked why aren't there more African vessels uh, carrying African goods, but also carrying other goods as well. African trade via the sea has been dominated by foreign, uh, foreign powers, foreign interests, foreign flags and countries. Uh, we're very vulnerable and very de dependent upon this trade, but we have very little say or input into its construction and the laws, for instance, which govern it are something which are often weighted historically in Africa's, uh, against, that, how, against Africa's favor. So for instance, uh, in the paper discusses there is no zero hour for African maritime security and development. What this means is that we've entered into an unlevel playing field right from the start and the laws governing the system or regime, which gov uh, a regime is something which is understood as the laws and norms and values which govern the expected behavior of participants in, in maritime trade have often been ones in which Africa has always been trying to catch up to. And the inability has been um, sort of seen as uh, made worse by the fact that African uh, ships are not involved in this process. So it's not just about ships as well in terms of having ships at sea. The creation of an African, for instance, maritime shipping liner network or um, registry would involve shipbuilding, would involve infrastructure uh, in investments in ports. And that has a large societal impact, a very positive one. Uh, an example which can be drawn from the United Kingdom was in Glasgow, uh, many ships uh, were built over the course of the 20th century and shipbuilding declined to a great extent, contributing to a lot of um, social uh, problems and, um, and a lack of investment in Glasgow. Now that's something which if it's rectified uh, or rather to take a lesson from that forward, investments in building ships can create uh, societal benefits in terms of supplying ships and also creating greater economic opportunities through greater networks and links created to the outside world. What is important to discuss here is a, a strange paradox or contradiction which might occur where Afri to take South Africa and as, as an example, South Africa is a maritime nation. It's very dependent on exports and imports. It also is a hub or a, a source. Uh, many goods traveling inland come to South Africa. But there are only three South African ships flying, its, uh, flying the South African flag at sea. Um, this would seem very strange, given the fact as well that a country like Mongolia has over 100, flags flying its, uh, 100 ships flying its flags at sea. Now, I, challenge anyone watching this to think, is there a more inland country than Mongolia? Yet it has all these ships flying its flags, it's flying its flag at sea. This raises an interesting issue of how ships, um, what kind of laws ships will uh, obey and use to regulate themselves. We often are confronted with something called a problem of flags of convenience. Now, um, traditionally, 
shipping was often carried out by ships from that country. Uh, you would load your ships onto your uh, merchant's vessels from your own country that would go overseas or be shipped in your own country. Where, but the costs of shipping have been uh, lessened in a way through uh, the liberalization of shipping. So we often have, uh, for instance, Mongolia, but countries like Liberia and Panama, very small countries without the ability to regulate their ships who fly their flag, because there are thousands of them, uh, taking their flag for various reasons. There is, for instance, cheaper costs, there are fewer regulations, uh, fewer restrictions. And so it's become an easier way of transporting goods uh, at a cheaper cost, but often without creating benefit for the countries from which uh, seafarers come from or who, who are crewing these vessels and also the goods, uh, the destination of the goods. Um, so there are many other paradoxes in that regard as well. Other countries, I mean, which, uh, which also are inland because it is a way of gaining state revenue. Uh, Africa has identified, or rather the African Union has identified the creation of its own shipping lines in that way to one, reduce the domination or the dependence on foreign flanked vessels, but also to create those wider societal benefits in, uh, for uh, African countries in that regard. Uh, so the those are some of the obstacles hindering African maritime transport. Uh, the promotion of growth is going to be or rather promoting growth is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, we could draw together the ideas of the potential vision of a blue economy in Africa characterized by a safe, sustainable and secure maritime domain where tri trade and transport and economic activities occur, but also in a secure environment policed or protected by African in, um, maritime navies and secure, um, security forces. Uh, there will be if we look at it in terms of uh, the idea of supply and demand for the future by 2050 or by 2063, intra-African intra trade will have increased. There will be greater investment in uh, countries in various economic activities. There will be a demand to ship goods. There will be the demand. The question is who will do the supplying? The question of how or why is secondary in this regard to who. The importance of, a, um, of national identity for the ship, it, for the uh, for the flag and the ships, is crucial in that regard. That's why flags of convenience are so important because it is easier to fly some flags in some country um, through some waters because of fewer restrictions. Now this brings me on to the concept of cabotage, which is one of the focuses of the paper. Cabotage is a controversial topic. It is also something which has been long pursued and has an historical. Um, legacy which needs to be untangled and critically discussed. Cabotage, under, briefly understood, is the is coastal shipping. It is moving goods within the coastal waters of one of one country or between two countries. So rarely deviate, um, sailing far away from the shoreline, um, never really entering the high seas, but always shipping between either ports within a country or, or neighboring countries. Now, this is something which can be quite lucrative, especially if there is a, a high uh, demand uh, for goods from that country, but also if it's easier to ship goods into one port in a country and then transship through to another part. Uh, the etymology comes from a, uh, a French word, and uh, it's understood in Portuguese as well. Uh, the word cabo for cape is to signify that sailing often occurs between cape to cape. Um, an interesting point to note as well is that we were referring here to coastal waters or territorial waters. Now these are seen as um, extensions of a state's uh, sovereignty or command over the seas to, an uh, to a length of tw 12 nautical miles away from the, the shoreline. Beyond that is the high seas. Now for instance, the high seas is um, very important in understanding certain maritime crimes. Piracy, for instance, only occurs on the high seas. That doesn't necessarily mean that pirates wait for the high seas and, uh, and attack ships on that, but that's how legally it is understood. Anything happening within the coastal waters, that 12 nautical mile band, is something which the coastal state should be better in, um, con in control of and monitoring. Um, so cabotage is seen as a domestic issue. It's not seen as something internationally 
which is uh, to be governed by, uh, for instance, the, the World Trade Organization. Uh, so states often create cabotage regimes, those rules and regulations, in order to restrict foreign ships from shipping goods within their country. That's partly to promote the growth of their own maritime industry, for instance, their own ships, uh, maritime sailors and a labor pool, and, uh, and to create wealth and keep it within the country, but also to uh, protect against a very strong competitor, for instance. Historically, that has been uh, with the colonial legacy in Africa. Uh, colonial powers have used their ships and uh, to transport goods in that regard. The development of an African maritime shipping industry has often been, had a, a great struggle right from the beginning. As I said earlier, the zero hour understanding has rarely been a moment where Africa has been able to uh, undertake or participate or to build this kind of shipping need because of the pre-existing interests which are very dominant. So historically it's a way of protecting your shipping. It's also a way of promoting your own skills and labor within your country. It had a military value because in the past it was seen that uh, if your ships are dependent on other countries and a war breaks out, you're going to be stuck because nobody is shipping your goods or you are not importing any goods that you require. Uh, ways of uh, creating this kind of restriction uh, mostly involve barriers, so the actual prevention of ships carrying other nations' flags. Uh, you can also create this through creating tax incentives and, uh, and various means of promoting within a country. But as, I've, uh, as, as a theme in the paper, and as I've said, Africa has historically struggled to create this kind of maritime industry. And uh, the promotion of cabotage is actually often at odds with transport plans, for instance, on land. You can use uh, rail or road networks to transport uh, on the land. But you can create, or rather, you can carry a great quantity of goods via ships, and the costs involved might work out in your favor in that regard. The pros, for instance, of cabotage are that, as I said, the skills are improved, you've reduced your dependency on other countries, and uh, you encourage cooperation. This is the theme picked up by the African Union, because they talk of a pan-African cabotage regime. So while I talk about cabotage as uh, a national or domestic issue, here we're talking about within regions or within the continent, uh, visualizing Africa as a big island where all waters are effectively combined or shared, there is a African maritime ship liner which can carry African goods within Africa, around Africa, with, to various countries, and potentially overseas as well. Some of the cons of this are unfortunately it's very expensive. We're not at the state now, at, or rather we lack the capacity to um, invest or to create that kind of uh, ship registry, the, the sh number of ships available, the number of maritime uh, skilled seafarers is unfortunately very small. And unfortunately it might discourage foreign trade as well because protectionism is uh, frowned upon in the current context. Uh, the World Trade Organization sets many of the rules uh, governing international or global trade. And uh, the mantra is in terms of liberalization, removing barriers, artificial barriers to trade. Uh, so cabotage may seem at odds with that, but given the fact that it is not often discussed at the WTO, it's seen as a, a national issue. Africa is now taking this forward to say, we want to be integrated 2050 in a much better way than we are now. With uh, Nkosasani Lamini Zuma's email to the future as part of Agenda 2063, talked about a confederation or a pooling, almost a pooling of sovereignty in the future. And we can see the same in terms of regional, regional wide as well. Within regions, there may be agreements on creating the capacity to ship within those regions, excluding foreign uh, flanked vessels. Um, so in the long term, it's a very good idea. In the short term, it's very expensive. It won't be quick, it won't be easy, and it won't be cheap to create that kind of African maritime shipping capacity. Um, an African-wide shipping company is encouraged but to create those kind of incentives is very hard. We're starting from a very low base. There is interest. There are a great deal of maritime industry uh, stakeholders and players, ship owners, uh, looking to create this kind of capacity. But the artificial barriers are very high. Politically, it will be a struggle as well. We're looking at uh, a, like say, a historical concept applied nowadays quite innovatively in terms of within regions, where regions have pulled their sovereignty. 
but for regions to unite and align and harmonize their policies in terms of transport won't be easy and will, will take some time still. The African Union, for instance, lacks a lot of the power to um, create the conditions for member states to uh, ratify or adopt these kind of ideas. Uh, member states have a great deal of discretionary rights in that regard. They do not have to follow the African Union as, as of yet. Uh, there is a revised African maritime um, trade charter, which was um, which requires 15 African states to uh, come into force. At present, only seven have ratified and deposited the treaty. This talks of creating a cabotage regime where African uh, flagged vessels carry African goods between African ports. But for the time being, we're still um, lagging in terms of that kind of political will to create the conditions there uh, nationally and regionally to uh, create better trade conditions. We do need to talk about some recommendations for the future. One of the main things, as I said, is when we talk about capacity, we often need to unpack that slightly. And a great deal of talk around maritime capacity will be about skills and skilled seafarers. At present, there are growing numbers of maritime institutes who will offer uh, or will provide the kind of educational needs or requirements for uh, African seafarers in the future. There are some in South Africa. There are others in West Africa as well. These have a very important part to play in the future. And uh, encouraging and supporting these kind of uh, institutes will play an important role in inc increasing capacity in the future. Uh, in greater investment in ports and infrastructure is required. Uh, the, the delays, for instance, in docking and um, offloading and, and basically conducting trade in African ports often acts as a disincentive to uh, to foreign shipping and but also to in the growth of uh, African shipping and uh, African maritime industry. Uh, there is a great deal of infrastructure investment coming in now, for instance, in East and West Africa from countries like China, which is investing billions in terms of improving maritime port facilities, expanding port facilities and creating new what's often called mega ports which will handle a lot of goods in the future. With China's case, this is um, conceptualized under its idea of a maritime Silk Road, which Africa will be an important part in the future, uh, connecting goods and trade between Europe and China and Africa. We'll see great deal, a great deal of, um, should we say, ec uh, extra activities and extra possibilities arising in Africa for the future. The commitment on national, regional, and economic, um, national, regional, and continental levels needs to be improved as well. Um, cabotage is, as I say, a controversial topic. There are many vested interests which would rather not discuss cabotage as an option, given, for instance, that it will impose barriers, that it um, goes against what's seen as the, uh, the common way of doing things in terms of trade nowadays, and also perhaps that there is not much within Africa to protect at present. But the important thing is to uh, do this simultaneously, to enable and encourage African growth, while also seeing that um, uh, foreign interests are regulated better. That we talk of reservations for African shipping or restrictions to benefit African shipping. Now, to work that out at a national level might be quite hard, uh, given, for instance, uh, transport networks within that country itself, to then create an African-wide uh, regime to um, which everyone can agree to and benefit will take some time. But this is a clear goal stated uh, within many documents within the African Union and at, uh, in terms of African development and security discussions and research. So the possibilities are there. It's very exciting to consider, for instance, as Nkosasani Tlamini Zuma did in her email, thinking of the future uh, where African ships and African flag vessels carry goods, not just within Africa, but also elsewhere in the world. It's a vision which is worth pursuing. A blue economy vision is worth pursuing as well. But those fundamental steps now need to be taken in terms of increasing interest and capacity and investment in what we have right now. Shipping, investments for education, and uh, also creating regional interest uh, through regional economic communities. And also there is a part to be played. Uh, I've talked a lot of, for instance, at the governmental level, in terms of industry and business, creating a, 
a partnership with government to pursue these ways forward. Uh, that uh, would be possibly the best way to pursue these, uh, these things in the future. But also, we must consider what will be the response from uh, international stakeholders. As we said, there's a great deal of domination but or a dependency upon foreign players and foreign stakeholders. Now, the reaction will not always be as, uh, as beneficial or as uh, accepted as often is seen in many official documents. But the necessary political will can be generated at an African level to drive this forward and to create a very good argument for creating better African ownership of maritime trade and transport. Um, as I've said, the paper can be downloaded from our website. It can also be picked up uh, copies from our office in Pretoria. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for listening today uh, to this discussion on the possibilities for Africans, for Africa's open seas, uh, for maritime trade.